Hi everyone, I'm here at the British Embassy in Tokyo and we just had the most amazing night. Um, obviously it's in the middle of World Cup fever here in Japan and we've had a phenomenal night with six rugby all-stars on a wonderful panel with talking all things about the game and I've just managed to grab two of the, the rugby greats and bring them in for a quick conversation. Um, I'm joined by Andy Nichols, one of the most successful uh, Scottish international players with two uh, British Lions tours and then with Kosai Ono, a local, um, interesting, Kosai actually grew up in Christchurch, New Zealand and went to a high school which I understand turned out 50 All Blacks but now came back to Japan, played for the Japan national team and still playing in Japan. So first question actually to Andy, um, you're working now obviously as a BBC commentator, you hang around the game a lot and have been to a few World Cups. Just describe for everybody what this experience in Japan has been like. It's been a fantastic experience. I mean, since we, whenever we knew we were coming to Japan, to Asia for the first time for a Rugby World Cup, I think everyone was very excited, but it was still a, an element of the unknown because um, I'd been every year to the Hong Kong Sevens for the last 10 years, so I'd, I'd experienced rugby in Asia, but not a World Cup. And so this is where it's been fantastic. I'd never been to Japan before. And everyone I've spoken to, and my own personal experience, the welcome has been incredible. The, the friendliness of everyone, literally everyone in Japan, and to, to just embrace the Rugby World Cup has been truly remarkable. And, you know, I was at the Scotland-Russia game down in Shizuoka, and there were 17,000 children, school kids, in the stadium. Um, half with Russian flags, half with Scottish flags. So it's created a wonderful environment and playing environment for the players to play in. But for the, the fans who have come, it's just been a truly memorable experience. I've absolutely loved it. I agree. I mean, I've been so privileged mm. to have been here just for the week and I went to the England-New Zealand game on Saturday and just an electric atmosphere and meeting so many people that have never been to Japan before. Yeah. And Kosai, obviously, as a local, yep. what does it mean to you and what does it mean to the people of Japan to have had this event here? Oh, for me personally, it's been wonderful. Like um, You couldn't have dreamed it um, to be a more successful tournament for me. Um, growing up, my parents used to always say, respect people, respect, respect. And I think the Japanese culture is built around respect. Um, it's a value of, of rugby and I think the Japanese people have bought into the sport itself and the fans from around the world and embraced, respected the fans from around the world. There's so much respect going on the field that the fans um, off the field respecting each other, enjoying enjoying what Japan has to offer, not just here in Tokyo, but throughout the whole country. It has been amazing. I, I want to switch gears now. Um, I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at Refinitiv, lead uh, several thousand salespeople around the world. And I think there's many parallels you can draw, draw between mm -hmm. high performance, whether it's sports or in business. And you know, one of my big things is you know, the importance of commitment to building your personal skills, continual learning, continual development. Yep. As a player, I just love your perspective on you know, what you've put into getting to the top. Yep. And what, what's a typical week for you like in terms of commitment? Yeah, right. So like, Everyone starts their training week on a Monday and you build through the week to, to perform on the Saturday. So, but one thing I will remember leading into the last World Cup, um, Japan obviously had their best win ever over South Africa, stunned the world. Um, two months out before that um, game, I was at a training, started the training, knocked the ball on twice. Eddie Jones, who was our coach at the time, blew the whistle, walked off the field. So we had 30, 30 stunned Japanese people going, What's going on? And Eddie came back 10 minutes later and he said, mate, you've lost the ball, on, knocked the ball on twice. South Africa are probably going to be 14 nil up. You need to focus from the start. And that was like, that was the first time that I thought, because you know, you build into a game or you build into, um, high, in, into a high performance environment and you're like, okay, I'll, I'll ease my way into it. But that was a real eye opener into, like, training's on, game's on. Like, what you do on the field on a Saturday, it has to be done every day to get the result. So, um, yeah, that changed my whole mindset towards training. It doesn't matter whether it's weight, whether it's an, an analysis, whether it's a meeting. As soon as the meeting or training starts, I have to switch on because unless I do, South Africa could be 14 nil up. And, and that's always been a huge reminder for me. 
that you're not just letting yourself down, but you're letting the team down. Well, yeah, I thought, I thought, well, I got made the example of, so I felt that little on the right. rugby field, right? But, um, but look, it, it actually woke everyone up and thought, look, um, you have to actually turn up every single day to get high performance, because yeah. if you're not doing it, someone else is, right? So um, it's always putting, from, from the first whistle, it's a rugby term, but um, yeah, you've just got to focus and you've got to take it to them, otherwise someone's going to take it to you. Andy, you did a really fabulous job tonight moderating the panel, and I actually thought one of the most fabulous comments uh, by uh, Rich was, you know, he talked about that you can't be a star without mm. an amazing yep. team, and I just thought that was really just so spot on. You've led teams. How do you, are you talking to a sales leader or a leader of a rugby team, how do you get the most out of a team? So I think I learned from, from a young age, without, I, I don't think I understood what it was that I was learning, that you had to treat everyone on an individual basis. So if you're in a changing room with 14 different individuals, using one management style, leadership style, communication style, you're not going to elicit the same response. And I, I, didn't, I don't think I sort of understood it in these terms, but a lot of emotional intelligence is a massive factor when you're leading teams. And, uh, and I think I understood what that was without understanding what it was, if that makes sense. Once I've moved out of rugby and into business now, I just think that's so important. You've got to communicate. You know, communication is only as good as the response it elicits. And if, so if you're not getting the right response from people, you've got to change your communication style. So I've learned an awful lot in rugby that I've been able to bring into the business environment. And um, there's so much you learn in a rugby environment, a team environment. You know, in rugby, I think it's the ultimate team sport because you can only do your job when other people have done theirs. And, and in business, that's exactly, that's absolutely, you might be, you know, a, a sole trader, but there's still people that, you, that will help you be that sole trader. But in a business like Refinitiv, everyone works with each other. You've got to work with each other in any sales team. And I just think that reliance, that dependability, that reliability, that, that sort of responsibility that you've got to, that I've got to do my job to allow somebody else to do theirs, is what really engenders team spirit. Yeah. And I talk about teamship. A lot, Deb, which is much more than team team spirit. It's about that that connection that you really get, and I think rugby has that because you know that you know I need to do my job to allow Kosi to do his, and and that's where you get that connection. So it's much more than just being part of a team. It's almost that dependency on each other. And once you get that, and once you get that, it's quite easy to get that in a sporting environment. When you get it in a business environment, it's so much more rewarding. And it's uh, I've had it a few times, and it's uh, really fantastic to experience it. I agree, and I, I actually feel pretty privileged because I have an amazing team. Um, let's talk about resilience. Um, you know, seven weeks here in Japan, and before you get to the knockout rounds, it's sort of week after, you know, week after week, a game, you win some, you lose some. And, and the sort of the mental, you know, attitude that comes into it, I'm interested from both of you. I mean, how do you kind of pick yourself up after a big loss? Or how do you pick yourself up if you, you know, had a knock on or you fumbled mm. or you missed a kick? How do you pick yourself up and get your head back into the game? Don't know if that do you want me to go? For me, it's next job, Deb. It's, you cannot affect what's happened, but you really can influence what's about to happen. So it's, we sometimes hold, in, in business, I've really experienced people holding a grudge or, or holding a, a bad presentation or a bad meeting. Well, that's not going that, to, that, that's not going to, you can't change that but that can influence your next meeting or your next presentation. So resilience for me is about dusting yourself down and moving on to the next job. Learning from the experience, but then doing it differently next thing. If you do the same thing again, you've not learned, mm. and then, th then you're the fool. So that's where, that's where the resilience is all about do, making conscious de decisions to do something differently from what you've learned from the previous experience. And in rugby, you know, the, wh whatever England did last Saturday against New Zealand, and it was most of it was brilliant, mm. it means nothing when they start at six o'clock on Saturday because they've got to go all over again. Now, the references and experience from last Saturday will help them and their belief will be strong, but they've still got to go out and do it. And, New Ze and South Africa will throw many different challenges mm -hmm. and so they've got to find ways of overcoming these challenges. So it's about living in the moment, not, not living in the past and not living in the future, living in the now, dealing with what, you're, what you've got in front of you and using everything that's happened in the past yeah. to get you through that. sort of experience in picking yourself up yep. but you know I mean what's in the heads of these teams as yep. well um, I think someone said on the panel England got to be humble can't yep. be you know too obnoxious coming yep. out of what was an amazing game mm. 
South Africa perhaps you know being the underdogs. But but talk about it from your perspective in terms of resilience and getting ahead into the next game. Well, I think you know, there's there's so much that you can and can't control about a rugby game. You can control yourself, your next actions, your next mindset. So it's about what, what you just touched on, but it's about what you can control and what you can do next. So I think, um, look, the guys especially can't control the outcome on Saturday, but they can control how they recover, yeah. how they train, what's in front of them, how can they next prepare for the next meeting, the next training. Exactly. So it's not it's about not thinking too far ahead, just control what's next in front of you. So I think that's what all they're doing, just taking it day by day um, at this stage in the tournament. So I'm going to give you both the $64 million question. What is it? Wednesday night, Saturday game. We just heard, I think, pretty much everybody on the panel, mm. you know, call it for, um, for England. Yep. Um, Andy, what do you think we're going to see on Saturday? Um, I think if England play anywhere near the intensity and the quality levels that they hit last Saturday against New Zealand, they win and they win convincingly. And by that, I mean maybe 10 to 15 points. Um, the only way I can see South Africa influencing that is if they can impose their physicality and their ability to control this, this, the ball and hence then the speed of the game because they've got such physical forwards. If they can do that and, and just stop England's pace, then they've got a chance of it being closer. But I think there's got to be a massive drop-off from England. To, to allow South Africa to even have a chance of winning this game. So England are clear favourites for me. England won this World Cup when they beat New Zealand last Saturday and Wales didn't beat South Africa on the Sunday because I think Wales would have given England a much more different challenge because there would be a mental challenge because of the whole Six Nations rivalry. Now, we'll never know how that was going to pan out because Wales never managed to beat South Africa. But as it currently stands, I can only see one winner on Saturday. What about Saturday. Wales and New Zealand on Friday? Well, that's the game that nobody wants to play in, isn't it? <laughs> Although, if you say that, I think Scotland would love to have a chance to be playing in the third, fourth playoff. Um, it's, it's a horrible game. No, genuinely, nobody wants to play in it. It doesn't mean anything. You know, are they going to boast about being third or fourth? No, they're not. They're not, they're not first. And in rugby, in a World Cup, it's all about being one. And that's what England are trying to do on Saturday. So, Kasai, what are you expecting to see or hoping to see on Saturday? Yeah, like Andy just said, if in, uh, England matched that intensity last week, they're going to be pretty hard to stop. Um, for me, you touched on it, the physicality of the South Africans. Traditionally in rugby, you pick five forwards on the bench, three backs on the bench. Um, they've gone for a 6-2. So you think the starting team's getting a little bit tired, but the guys that are coming on are getting bigger, stronger, mm. faster, fitter. Um, so it's going to be that. In, in games of one and loss, um, the guys that were on the panel today, you know, one's won it for, with a last minute drop goal, mm. an extra time. Um, you know, Richie and Dan um, in their 2011 campaign, it came down to one point. Mm. Like, so when when it's the toughest minutes, the South Africa are going to have that big physical advantage. So I think, um, uh, who knows? But I'm tipping England. Yeah, I think, yeah, I have to say. So look, thank you guys. Um, you're both amazing. It's been a wonderful night. We're really privileged to have you here. I'm sad I have to go home tomorrow. I've really got oh, swept no. <laughs> up in this whole incredible rugby fever here in Japan. Um, I actually, I'm an Aussie. I don't have a horse in the race on uh, Saturday, and I have a bunch of people on my team from uh, South Africa and from England. So I think the safest thing for me to say is um, good luck and may the best team win. <laughs>